Nsi, which is popularly known as voodoo or juju, is the mending and melding of spiritual matter known as mo for the purpose of achieving what you want it to achieve. Odin is the science of ancestral understanding and one of the fields of spiritual technology or applications that can emerge from this knowledge is the art of Nsi. The greatest lie about Africans denies their contribution to human inventiveness and civilization. The big idea that this lie tries to sell you is that the things attributed to human greatness or human ability and creativity either didn't exist in ancient Africa or exist at an inferior level. Now, most of us know this isn't true. The state of the art in archeology span and the study of history and peoples has already debunked this idea. But even at that, there's a very big mistake that we currently make when we challenge this idea. It's a mistake that you may even be guilty of. Art, science, and complex societies that are attributed to other cultures existed in Africa in equal levels as the rest of the world. But what about the things that Africa holds uniquely? Things that are very African and very rare beyond the continent and its diaspora. The average person would dismiss Juju. They would dismiss any claims of it being real. They would dismiss any stories from your personal experience of you witnessing it happen and exist. It's very common and easy for the average everyday person to dismiss stories about communicating with the dead, astral projection, shape shifting, and even conversing with elements of nature such as rivers, land, and the sky. It's very easy to dismiss the use of charms and amulets to enhance a person's abilities, be it attractiveness, wealth, strength, or protect them from the chaotic nature of fate. The term music therapy, which is used for dementia, surgery recovery, cancer, and other things. But when Africans came to the shores of North America, telling stories of a man named Mumbo Jumbo, who was able to heal people using music alone, not only were they dismissed, the name became synonymous for anything that comes out of a human mouth that should be dismissed. This dismissal is standard, and it often happens until there is a Western name or a Western label for something that Africans have been doing before Westerners. Meaning that at all times, while archaeology, research, and the state of the art in historic understanding will tell you that ancient African societies were equal to the societies around the world, we still have a hard time saying that they know and do things that others did not. There's something very interesting about who does the dismissal in Western society in particular, because believe it or not, there is a pattern if you pay attention to who does it. This dismissal doesn't stem from the elites in Western society. This dismissal comes from the everyday individual, the Ofeke, who is unaware of African knowledge, but also unaware of the knowledge of the people who control their society, which makes you wonder if this dismissal is deliberate. Pay attention to this. For an Igbo Dibia, astral projection is routine. It's a part of their training and their healing practice and something well understood under the name of Ekili. Now to many, the concept of transferring yourself as a light being from one place to another and being able to use that light being to communicate and act beyond the understood rules of time and space is mumbo jumbo. Yet in the highest levels of Western power, this is a truth that they live by. Listen to the story. According to Odinani Ndibo, our ancestors say that Alamo, the world of spirits, has a way of keeping itself safe from Alamado, the world of people. According to our Igbo ancestors, the world is divided into four world ages. And in the third world age, Ugamu, human beings reached a level of mastery, knowledge, and connection to Alamu and all of the gifts it has to offer. Like their own world, they saw that Alamu was governed by law, by cause and effect, and ultimately ruled by balance. And if this balance was broken, what could be unleashed or placed in the wrong hands could at best enslave humanity and at worst wipe it from the face of the earth. We're currently in the fourth world age, Ugazi, an age where all human knowledge is directed towards confusion, destruction, manipulation, and corruption. 
human ancestors in Ogawa saw what would become of the human race in Ogazi. And so they chose to die with the majority of their knowledge, vowing not to pass their full knowledge to the corrupted people to come after them. Because if their terrifying power and connection to Alamo was placed in the wrong hands, in the hands of people today, you and I are both in trouble. By 1968, the European empires that had subjugated the world had been destroyed. In the rubble of World War II, only the United States and the Soviet Union stood as the two powers with the capacity to rebuild and inherit these empires and stand alone in controlling, subjugating the planet. This was the height of the Cold War, and on both sides, governments and scientists had dedicated their full attention, energy, and resources towards developing the capacity to not only destroy their rival, but if need be, destroy the world itself. No option was off the table. In that year, the United States had confirmed that the Soviet Union had taken this pursuit beyond what a laboratory can offer. 1968 was the year the U.S. had confirmed the Soviet Union's dedication and full focus into what it called paranormal research for the sake of making war. It had now been confirmed that the research of Semyon and his wife Valentina Krillian used the technique of high-frequency electromagnetic photographing to confirm the fact that certain people had a bluish-greenish aura around them that could not be seen by the naked eye. In this research, the Soviets and the U.S. spies that were observing had penetrated the barrier of the once protected world of the unseen. The Americans labeled this mysterious auraic substance as bioplasma, dubbing that the Soviets were 20 years ahead of them in the research of bioplasma through the help of yogis and ancient texts. The United States dedicated its own resources to harnessing the power of bioplasma in an initiative known as the Stargate Project. To execute this, the United States put together UCLA, the Southwest Hypnosis Research Center, and the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research to begin the pursuit of what it labeled psychic spies, astral spies capable of using astral projection to reach anywhere in the world gather intelligence undetected, giving the United States government a dominant hold and access to a level of reality that had been sealed away for thousands of years. And pay attention to that, the fact that the astral world, the world of the spirit, had been locked away by the ancients. Because what ends up happening next in the story blew my mind. Something that gave me chills when I first read the documents on the Stargate Project. Listen close. The first successful U.S. military astral projection project was done by a woman by the name of Beverly Chalker, under the watch of researcher Edward Pullman. In this experiment, Beverly was able to travel from a location in Dallas all the way to a location in New Jersey. She reported seeing a man sleeping on a bed with a light on. She also gave descriptions of the man himself. She described the man's pajamas and the decor in the room. Now, this particular project was made public, as well as the second successful attempt which was a young girl who was able to use astral projection to read a five-digit number hidden on a high shelf in another room while she was asleep, then wake up and relay the number to researchers. The U.S. government continued leaking the success of these projects to the public, which spurred a trend of people trying to astral project or experiment on themselves. By the early 70s, there were books and audio tapes available for anybody who wanted to learn how to do astral projection. On the government end, they had successfully created psychic spies who were able to penetrate hidden rooms, create maps, describe the layouts of hidden places, detailed papers, documents, and locations that were previously outside of the government's reach. But even with this success, things quickly grew dangerous. And in fact, what's going to happen next is the reason you don't hear much about this division of the U.S. government's spy project anymore. A woman in Berkeley, California began warning the public of the dangers of astral projection about her own trip, leaving her body, and then struggling to get back in. She pleaded with the public to realize how dangerous it is and hoped there would be a halt in the trend and ongoing research in the project. People who were projecting into the astral realm were observed with having incredibly high body temperatures and then wake up screaming in horror as if all at once 
A wave of failed experiments and trips began to rack the nation. After studying in India, a man by the name of Robert Antosazeski tried his hand in the practice. Now, his yogis had warned him not to do it. And in fact, these were the same yogis that the Russians were consulting in order for them to do their own experimenting. Around this time, the Russians and the Americans had began to ask themselves a question. Can these astral spies become astral assassins? Can you use astral space or astral travel to move from one location to another, kill a person, and then return to your body? Practitioners of this time began to send out warnings saying that they feel the presence of something menacing creeping into the astral space. Both the US and the Russians had increased their security. And with that being done, they went all in in the creation of astral assassins. Around this time, and in the astral space, Robert reported seeing a beautiful woman, a beautiful foreign looking woman, as he described. Now Robert was enamored and had reported that the woman was beckoning him as if she wanted him to follow her somewhere that he wasn't aware of. She wasn't human and when he woke up, he was obsessed. He told his roommate that he's going to enter the astral space again and that the roommate should not open the door or bother him until he himself was ready to speak. So for another time, Robert entered the position that his yogis had taught him. He entered the astral space. An hour passed, and then another, until several hours later, his roommate had a burst in the door to see what was going on. Robert was sitting in the same position, and when his roommate went to touch him, he realized that Robert was dead. There were no signs of ill health. Robert was a vegetarian, and all of his organs were in great condition. Doctors had no answer for the cause of death. Experts from India reported that he refused to return to his body. A wave of deaths related to astral projection experiments began to reach the news. Realizing the Americans were now experiencing what they were experiencing, the Russians wrote to the Americans that the astral space is to be used for good. And this was confirmed when researchers found an old Kemetic script dating back to 1250, which stated that in the astral space, there is a spirit one will encounter, a woman who the people of Kemet had named Amut. Amut was a great spirit and protector. She was a shapeshifter, often appearing as a beautiful woman to those who do not belong in the space, but ultimately revealing her form as the destroyer of souls. The government went quiet about its research and astral projection. Soon after, the media went quiet with them. Those who practiced on their own gradually went silent. Those who did not go silent, such as Charles Manson, Herbert Mullen, who killed 13 people, and the son of Sam serial killer, David Berkowitz, ushered in the death of several people. Prominent professors who had engaged in the study of astral projection, such as Eugene Bernard of UCLA, disappeared from the public eye. And it was speculated that Dr. Pullman, the first person to successfully perform it in a US government controlled setting on his own subject, may have used it on Jack Ruby, a close business partner of his, and Jack Ruby would go on to assassinate Lee Harvey Oswald, the killer of John F. Kennedy. So before I start, I want to announce that we are officially starting our traditional medicine classes. We are going to be teaching traditional medicine for those who are practitioners or feel that they have the calling to be a practitioner. And these classes will be available at www.gedu.me. I'm happy to announce that our in-house DBA service is officially back. Yes, we officially have the in-house DBA back. Uh, it took me almost two years, maybe say a year and a half, uh, to once again find somebody that I can sit down with and trust and know that they're able to deliver on what my audience expects. So if you're interested in readings, you have concerns that you want to address with Adibia um, or certain ceremonies that you want performed for you, such as Iraq or Afa Divination, join on patreon.com slash the medicine shell. Again, the in-house Dibia is officially back. Thank you so much for your patience. Thing number three is I finally, finally, finally have t-shirts. <laughs> One of the things we always discuss in the uh, Odinati group study, uh, which is a group study we have on Patreon where we discuss different topics together and things like that, is the fact that we as a generation are a generation of awakening, right? Well, there's an awakening happening all over the world. Um, and because we're kind of on the front line or we're the first to do it, we're going to need to be bold. And so finally, if you're interested in learning the Igbo language this year, in fact, if you have vowed to yourself 
or made a promise to yourself to learn the Igbo language by the end of 2023, we have an Igbo language school at www.kedu.me. Gedu.me teaches the Igbo language as the Igbo language, so we don't mimic an English language uh, learning program. Uh, students are paired with both class and a coach, your coach being a person who is at home in Nigeria who can speak Igbo with you and you speak back with them and you get to practice and make mistakes in a no judgment safe space that moves at whatever pace you want to move. And then of course class where we dissect the language piece by piece and study the language as our ancestors passed it down to us. We are currently signing up for classes. The next session is coming up soon. And so go ahead and sign up at www.gedu.me to learn the Igbo language this year. And with that being said, let's begin. So oh. before I go any further, I want to explain that um, my voice is going to be very hoarse. Um, I don't know. After I recorded that last segment, uh, I woke up next morning with no voice. So I don't know if it's my ancestors telling me to shut up or I don't know if they said... <laughs> I don't know if they sent David Berkowitz to choke me out in my sleep. But either way, I'm going to get these bars off, so um, enjoy. In order for me to do a deep dive on Nsi, there are a few things that we have to understand. One, Nsi is the Ogun of Mwa. Therefore, it's going to be important for us to understand Ogun, the source of Ogun, what Mwa is, then how or what the science of manipulating and working with Mwa looks like in Odinani Ndibo. And in the end, I'll reveal a secret group of ancient people who all black Africans, Igbo and beyond, and indigenous people through the different continents, say, revealed to them the secrets of all and sin. According to Odinan Indibo, your creator is your mother and your father. Your mother and father were created by their mother and father, who themselves were created by their mother and their father. Now, just like you, your mother and father, and those that came before them, carry both the traits of their mother and their father. If you trace your lineage back far enough, you will arrive at the earth being your mother and the sky being your father. And therefore, our ancestors say that all people carry the traits of both their mother and their father. Men, while having the traits of both, will reflect the physical manifestation of their father. And women, while having the traits of both, will reflect the physical manifestations of their mother. As each person grows, the physical phenomena that will happen to their bodies will best match the same gendered parent. And this is what we call being male and being female. If you continue down the line of your ancestors, going from your grandparents to their grandparents and so on and so forth, you will eventually arrive at the earth and the sky. Allah, Naigwe, are both mother and father of humanity. They are among our ancestors and are thus acknowledged as so. But it's very important to remember that even though you will reflect the physical trajectory of your gender equivalent parent, you as an individual will carry the nature of both your mother and your father. Remember this. If you go beyond Alanigwe and trace their genealogy and their heritage, you will arrive at the mother and father of all things. Chi na eke meaning that existence is fathered by a creator and mothered by creation, which is where you get the phrase Omo Ajana na Omo Bakwando Eligwe, a phrase used by Odinani practitioners to describe humanity, but specifically translating to children of sand and star. Now, Alanigwe, just like us, has parents. It has a mother and a father by which it came from, meaning that there is an animating force which is not physical and that which the force acted upon to create, which is chi na eke. And in the same way that you carry the nature of both your mother and father, though you reflect one more than the other, this pattern goes all the way to the beginning of creation. You have a particular nature which is physical, which Ndibo call Mado. And you have another nature, which is not physical, which Ndibo call Mo. Because all things come from this divine couple, all things have that about it which you can see and that about it which you cannot see. The same way you carry the nature of your mother and your father. In order to survive, human beings were gifted with a power. And this power would go to define humanity itself from the beginning of our existence till today. This power was handed to us by a little known secret race of people 
who were the first to master the elements of nature. And this gift was known as Ogun. Ogun is when human intellect uses the elements of nature to create an effect. Music uses voice and instruments to create a composition. A Dibi Umbarogun will use roots to create medicine, which creates healing. Anytime an element of nature is used by the human intellect to create an effect, you are witnessing Ogun. And we are all familiar with the Ogun that deals on the surface level primarily with the physical. We are aware of chemistry and Ogun that applies human intellect towards the understanding and manipulation of chemicals. We understand physics as an Ogun that applies human intellect towards understanding and manipulating physical matter. But unlike physics, our ancestors acknowledge that like the creator, all things are of a physical nature. And then there's the other half of the world or the other material that is not physical. And the Ogun for understanding and using more towards human purposes to create an effect is known as nsi. Nsi, or juju as it's popularly known, is the science of manipulating spirits or the spiritual material known as more. More is of a very specific nature. Some elements of this nature are familiar to those who can only see the terrestrial. There are elements of more or a nature to more that is unlike anything in the physical or visible world. And understanding the nature of more the way a physicist would have to understand the nature of matter unlocks the door to being able to apply your own creativity or human intellect towards using it for human purposes. And this is how our ancestors arrived at what we now refer to as Nsi Juju Voodoo alchemy or African magic, African black magic, if you want to sound ridiculous. So one of the things that makes putting this video together a little difficult is it's difficult to know where people draw the line on what is juju and what isn't. Anybody who's observing from an unbiased point of view um, or is looking at the facts will tell you that any scientific application that comes directly from Africa is first considered black magic, voodoo, all these different things. And then when outsiders adopt it, then it loses that label. In fact, if you're aware of the Egyptian origin uh, story of the word chemistry, uh, the word itself means uh, black mystery or black magic arts, alchemy, something along the lines of the blackness or black arts, black magic, that kind of thing. And the list goes on and on. I have a video called Ogun Explained where I explain how vaccination, inoculation, these things were considered African uh, voodoo rituals, or I don't know how you want to phrase it, African voodoo rituals before they were finally adopted by George Washington and uh, the guy who did the Salem witch trials. So if you want to uh, hear that story and that whole history, I have a video called Ogwen Explained, the link is below. But for the sake of this video, I'm going to specifically refer to Nsi that pertains to Mo. And to understand this science, we must go back to the beginning. And before this current form of the universe that we exist in, Wa Bo, the world of twos, we were in the world of one, the singularity known as Alma. Alma is the mother of existence, and from Alma, the chi element within separated itself from the physical form. The chi is intention and design. Whereas what was left from the separation is a cosmic material known as Ma. Now Ma is also known as Mo, and I'll explain why, but in a lot of dialects, you will see the word Ma being used to say Mo because fundamentally they point back to a similar concept. When the Chi focuses on one point, it creates a concentration of that cosmic material, Ma, to that single point. The distinction between the two, if we are to say there is one, is that Madon is where that concentration is most dense. And the further you go away from it, the less dense, the more ethereal, until it's no longer within what we can measure with our five senses. And this is the nature of all things in Uwa Bo, the world of twos. All things have a physically measurable density at their center, which fades and dissipates as you go further and further from that center until it becomes ethereal. In a human being, that dense center is known as Madon or Ma Dindo, Ma that is alive or Ma that is being guided. And then that less dense outer layer that radiates outward from that center is 
more an ethereal light or force that surrounds each and every human being and everything in nature. There are several examples of how this appears in nature. One of the most visible and well-known aspects of African spirituality is the use of sacrifice, specifically blood sacrifice from specific animals. And this is because during this process known as Itraja, it's not the full blood that is sought after, but rather the blood plasma the ethereal surrounding outer layer that carries the platelets of blood, but in itself carries the properties of more, which I'll explain shortly, and therefore has a certain power signature that practitioners find useful. There is often the use of eggs, but it's not the dense yolk at the center that's sought after within the egg, but the surrounding more like formation known as albumin, that outer layer of the egg, which represents the more in the formation within the shell. And then there is, according to Odinani, the most perfect example of the chi that human beings are privileged to see on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is the sun, or the abara known as anyangu, with what we call the sun being the dense center and then the rays of Anyangu being the more portion of that formation, which is why Anyangu goes by the full name Anyangu Nabara or Anyangu Nabaraya, Anyangu and her spirits. Now, just like in the case with Juju, we are aware that we can use the sun's rays in order to do things for human purposes, such as taking in the sun's rays to create solar power. I was made aware of the fact that there is a very specific type of ironsmithing furnace that our ancestors used that was specifically powered by sunlight, or the flame within was lit by the sun. There are also personal applications of the use of the mo or the abara of the sun towards human purposes, such as the utilization of sunlight to power the ikenga, the masculine energy or the power to do within each person. So if you guys are interested on a video about Anyangu, comment below. Now that ethereal outer layer known as mo that every human being has, which we may refer to as a person's spirit or a person's aura or their light, can be used to do different things the exact same way the rays of the sun or blood plasma can be used for different applications. And the use of this mo brings us into the science of Juju. Now to break down the science of Juju, I'm going to walk you through five natures that Mo has and how each of these natures are used in implementations that we would refer to as Voodoo, Juju, or Nsi. The first nature is that Mo is spaceless or Mo operates differently from Madu and physical matter when it comes to space and time. Mo operates in a nature that we refer to as fifth dimensional, meaning that everywhere you have been, Mo leaves a trail that's a photocopy of what you were doing in that exact time and space when you passed it. Now, some also say that Mo also repeats this pattern ahead of you, meaning that all the places you are going to be, your Mo is already there. If you were in a room drinking a cup, there is a light remnant of you that remains there still repeating that motion of drinking that cup. If you have slept in a bed, there is a light remnant of you that is still on that bed. And this creates an ever going trail from the very place you began to the place you are now of your more, which never fully goes away, but weakens with its radiance over time. This is why when you enter somebody's bedroom, you feel their essence there. Or if you go into somebody's car, you feel a different essence than a car that's been abandoned or a room that's been abandoned for a long time. Now, because more on its own fades over time, the remnants of more you leave behind that have physical remnants to accompany them are a lot more powerful. For example, pieces of your hair, old clothing, or old items that you used to own and use regularly. And because they're still linked to you, a practitioner can take that hair or take that piece of clothing and use it to affect you despite you not being there in physical time and space with them. This is what's often referred to as a voodoo doll, an implementation or an effigy of a person that uses something that has their spiritual signature on it or their more such as old clothing or hair or even blood and then using that effigy to affect that person wherever they may be in time and space. Now, while the voodoo doll is often understood or depicted as a means of hurting a person, you can use this exact principle to do just the opposite. For example, certain charms will link you to the more of various animals that may have traits that you need at a particular moment. Through the same principles, a debia can be linked to a dog the animal manifestation of the Debia. A wrestler can be linked to a cat 
or Wamba, literally translating to baby wrestler. And in a really funny example that um, I read in this uh, book that I'll link below, there was a man who had erectile dysfunction and they took a piece of cloth and tied it to the horn of a ram. Then they took that same piece of cloth and tied it to his um, member. I'm just doing this for YouTube purposes. And um, unfortunately, they never untied it from the ram. The ram got away. And the man ended up having an erection for like three weeks. <laughs> Ended up having an erection for like three weeks. So um, so I, I know that Blue Chew sponsors a lot of channels, so they don't uh, hurry up and start sponsoring this one. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go into business for myself. <laughs> Give you the real Blue Chew. <laughs> When representing your ancestors at your altar, it's advised to use things that they have physically touched before or have used in their time alive. The second nature is that mo is your orbit. Now, earlier I spoke about anyangu nabara, or the sun and its rays, or the sun and its spirit, as a reflection of how madu and mo forms throughout time and space. Another representation of this is alanigwe, the earth and the sky, the earth being the densest form or the madu form and the relationship, and then the sky being its spirit, its aura, or its mu. Now the rules of igwe, or the sky, are also the rules of mu. And very similar to the sky, things can float around in your mu that then affect what happens to the madu, as madu and mu are constantly communicating with each other and informing who you will be in totality. Certain things can be put in your orbit that affect how you function as a human being. One example is Uchu. Uchu is a spiritual signature or energy that can be put into your own spiritual orbit. Uchu can repel potential suitors. Uchu can attract misfortune. Uchu can affect things such as fertility, childbirth, or even impact your own behaviors in an unnatural way. Now, if you want me to do a video explaining Uchu or curses, go ahead and comment below. But there is a way to protect yourself from all of these things that I'm mentioning, by the way, because some of them could be a little scary. And I'll talk about this at the end of the video. Now, if we're looking at Mo as an orbit, it's important to remember that all of the things you have encountered in your life have left little pieces of themselves in your orbit. So you're constantly being informed by a Mo or a spirit that itself is being informed by your life experiences and so forth. And oftentimes a lot of these things are also having a similar effect as Uchu. Now, Western psychology is getting kind of close to addressing this particular aspect of more but of course there's a lot of pieces that still aren't quite there yet now before i go to the main protector one of the things i want to mention is that a common cleanser of this orbit something that commonly cleanses this orbit of unwanted particles is osaji or aji in general which is the kola nut now if you want me to do a video on kola nut how to use kola nut and all its different applications according to our ancestors, go ahead and comment below. The next nature of mo, the third nature that I'm going to describe is that it is responsive to stimuli. Mo at all times is responding to the stimuli that it's around or exposed to. This can be symbols, this can be light, sounds, and environments. And you can feel this if you're around a lake, you take in the mo of the lake and a certain type of nature overcomes you. If you are, if you're taking a walk in nature or you're out by the ocean, the same thing. If you listen to certain music, you take on a certain personality involuntarily. Your energy levels or different aspects of your being will respond to the stimuli due to the sinking nature that Mo has. Or as the Ilu says, when the eyes cry, the nose follows. Two auras encounter each other. They will meet each other at the middle, one taking on traits from the other and so forth. Certain symbols can be used to invoke certain directions or action in Mo as it is seen with the ancestral written language of Nsibiri. Now, I do have a video called Nsibiri Explained, which was a sacred writing language that spanned many cultures in Africa, primarily that lower Niger region 
into Cameroon and even into Congo. So if you're interested in learning more about Insibidi, I have a link to the video below. The responsiveness of more to sound is the reason the use of certain mantras and hymns, certain phrases and sayings are used to control or drive the nature of more towards one thing or another. Beyond the human spirit, certain spirits are specifically summoned by certain songs, sayings, and sounds, or the ritual around summoning them involves sound, color, and light. And once summoned, they can be used to do the bidding of the person who summoned them. Under the same logic, you can also use the names of your ancestors to summon their presence, which is why it's important to know the names of your ancestors. A great deal of um, practicing Igbo spirituality is doing the process of learning who your ancestors were, their names and their stories, um, and understanding that's a never ending journey. You'll never know them all. Uh, but for those who do not know, you can use the names Eke, Urie, Afo, and Mpo, and this will suffice as, according to Ndibo, all people have one of these four names based on the day they were born. If you're interested in knowing more about that concept, I have a video called The Four Market Days Explained, and the link is below. A lot of the instruments we use in Ogene music also have very specific spiritual properties. For example, the Oja flute rises the frequency of more for human beings, animals, and features in nature. Now, if you want a video on sacred instruments and sacred music, comment below. When speaking about juju or nsi, one of the things you will notice is uh, one of the names for this African art is jazz, which is of course the name of a music genre, but you sometimes have to wonder why. Now, during the era of slavery in the Western Hemisphere, it was becoming very clear to planters that the enslaved people were not only using drums to communicate with each other long distance, but they were also using it to coordinate escape, to coordinate rebellions, and invoke the spirit necessary to physically fight their captors. So throughout the United States, to keep the enslaved people at bay, African instruments were consistently banned in different localities, states, and counties. So enslaved people in North America decided to play their African music using the new instruments they would encounter in the United States. States. For example, if you take this Ogene standard of do 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 do, which you'd hear often in like masquerade shows and so forth, and change it with U.S. style instruments, you get da 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 da, and it's well understood that Ogene is a spiritual form of music, or it itself is magic. Now, of course, the black population in America go on to dominate cultural expression, especially when it comes to things like music in the United States. But at all junctions, every genre or style is met with accusations of being voodoo or in invoking trances or altering human behavior and so on and so forth, which is not 100% a lie. But again, if you want a video on uh, sacred music, go ahead and comment below. I'll go into detail. The next principle is the fact that more is governed by pattern. A person's more or their light, their spirit or their aura is very similar to a song that their body or personhood dances to. Everybody's more is a certain rhythm or a certain tempo that is very specific to them. It is a song that's you that has all of the voices from your life experience singing, all of the events playing, and so on and so forth. And this rhythm, this continuous rhythm, animates each and every single person. It informs how we end up moving to the music. For this reason, the patterns of music, as well as the patterns of dance or ritual, are necessary for communicating with Mo. This is why when Nsi is being performed, the process follows a very specific set of steps in order to invoke the proper spirit or the proper rhythm. It is said that to assure that all rituals are being done correctly, when a ritual is being done, Ekwensu is the Abara feared by all Abara. It is the force that Chuku places at the crossroads to assure that a crossing is done correctly. It is important to note that Ekwensu manifests in the human body as feelings of pressure, fear, anxiety, and extreme anger. 
as well as blinding will, blinding courage, or out of body levels of anger. Now, if you consider what our ancestors said, think about the feelings you feel just before you do something that is important to you. All of the feelings I described are feelings that are invoked in a person when they are approaching something that they're either very passionate about or something that they're chi allocated for them. And if you understand the way the chi works and how it allocates things, you'll know that there's no difference between the two things I just said. A great performer may become very nervous before they perform because they are doing something that their chi allocated for them or gave them the gift to do. And therefore, because it is a divine thing, the spirit that overwatches will swell their body with the anxiety necessary to assure they do it right. We actually had a really good discussion on this in the group study about anxiety and evil spirituality. Um, so if you're interested, the replay of it is on the Patreon. If you're a patron, just message me and I'll send you the link of it so that you don't have to spend too much time going through all the replays. And finally, more is governed by law. The laws of mu or spirit are similar to the laws of physical matter in that they are concrete and ordained by chuku. A lot of people fear juju or fear in si because a lot of it can be used to harm another person. And therefore there's always the fear of, did somebody place a curse on me? Is somebody trying to take my destiny? So on and so forth. But if you understand that mu or spirit is governed by the law of God, just as physical nature is, you will understand that not all things are possible with juju. Or as the fact attacking another person or doing something to another person is an exceptionally difficult draining thing to do for whichever debia that is asked to do the thing. Now the laws of more are many, but to sum it all up, all of more is governed by the laws of all four no. Your all four is a pact you make with your creator. It is what links you, your creator, and everything it takes to make you together. It is a solemn and divine oath that you make before coming into existence that also tells you who you are, who you will be, and how your life will pan out. Now, if all four is being followed, if a person is keeping to their divine laws and not sullying their hands, it is impossible for anybody to use juju or insane to attack you or do something to you that you yourself don't willingly and knowingly accept. Think of your connection to your chi as a house and think of negative juju as rain. If you are inside of your house, the rain won't touch you. If you step outside of the house, the rain will touch you. So no matter how much rain is happening outside, if you are within your alpha, if you are keeping alpha, if you're keeping your hands clean and sacred, nothing can happen to you. And this is why our ancestors, when they're breaking cola, when they are saying a prayer, or when they're visiting their altar, perform the process of ego alpha, Igofo is a declaration of one's righteousness by listing the things that you have not done, the impurities that you have avoided, and the evils that you have not partaken in. By regularly reaffirming your righteousness, you keep yourself and your forces accountable to the awful that you were born to keep. It's hard to imagine the idea of being born with a certain set of laws and codes that you're supposed to follow, but then not walking around knowing them. But the truth is you already know them. Oftentimes we can get distracted by the external face of a spiritual practice, but it really boils down to being a good you or being radically yourself because within yourself, there is a natural sense of what is just, what is true and what is right. And that is your awful. So don't worry if you're putting on the inzu the right way or if you know, okay, I was supposed to say awful five times and I said it two times. All that stuff does not matter as much as righteous behavior, good behavior and good ogun. Or as the Ilu says, Onye jiringwere atwa ja, bonye ogun ya zezi. The people who sacrifice lizards, or in other words, those who give unworthy sacrifices or improper sacrifices, or do sacrificing wrong, are the people with good ogun. A little cultural context, um, you do not give spirits what you yourself would not eat. But understanding the laws of cause and effect that govern juju, 
and omena la ndibo were not things that came 100% natural to all people in the beginning of time. It was said that the human race was taught these great arts, everything that I'm telling you today and everything that I'll be making videos about in the future, by a group of people known as Omonsi. Omonsi was a race of dwarf people. Many described them as dwarves with dreadlocks. And everywhere you go in black Africa, and beyond to many places where you find indigenous people practicing indigenous spiritualities. The story is the same, that these arts were taught to them by a group of dwarves. In many initiation rituals, an individual eventually is visited by them or sees them, and they are depicted in many of our cultural arts, charms and tools used to channel and work with Alamu. These dwarves are the source of the knowledge that human beings would eventually use to understand themselves. And with every lesson given, Omonsi taught that the earth is everything. The power that comes from her has cause and effect. And all that is given by the divine must be handled by righteous hands. That those who seek to use power to destroy are themselves destroyed by power. And what the hand does in Alam Mo, the hand receives in Alam Mado. Or as the Ilu says, Ono ba Oja, Oja ba Ono. The mouth plays Oja, the Oja plays the mouth. And that's it. If you want me to do a full video on Omon Si, uh, comment below. That being said, this is Derek Ofaro with The Medicine Show. Thank you.